recording, Georgia? Started, thank you. Okay, so great. So uh, welcome to the IMA Industrial Problems Seminar. Um, so if you're a regular of the seminar, you probably haven't seen me before, so I'm just filling in um, today. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm happy today to introduce the speaker, Dominique Peralt John Cass, who's a principal research scientist at Amazon. Um, and he, uh, he got his PhD in statistics at University of Washington uh, in 2012, um, and has worked in industry since then, also at the, also at the, um, also at the University of Washington. Um, and uh, so we're excited to see his talk today, which is on uh, meta analysis of randomized experiments, um, applications to heavy tailed response data. Um, and feel free, you know, throughout the talk, if you want to ask questions, um, there's a Q&A box uh, in Zoom, you can click and feel free to type a question in, or feel free to just, I, I think in the chat box, you can also type a question or it's possible you can raise your hand and I can I can I can answer uh, or I can click on you and you can you can ask the question as well. Um, we will also have um, a chunk of time at the end of the talk um, um, in which you can ask questions of the speaker. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand it off to you, Dominique. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so yeah, thank you for having me. I'm pretty excited to get this talk here. I certainly researched that. Uh, I'm, we're hoping to share more broadly because we're curious if other people can reproduce the, the work we've done, uh, which is a meta-analysis of, of a series of lab we ran internally on our supply chain. Um, now, the talk is recorded, it's public. Uh, that doesn't mean that some of my figures are normalized, right? Like I'm not showing any uh, absolute figures in terms of impact. Um, so don't be surprised by that. Uh, but everything that I'm showing here is already uh, available on archive. We have a paper uh, on archive that's uh, awaiting publication right now. So if you want, you're welcome to ask me a question or reach out to me, but there's also a much more detailed and complete paper on archive they can go and take a look at. Now, for the context of what this talk is about and why we cared about doing this meta-analysis, um, Amazon has a fairly complicated supply chain where we have to order things, we have to place them, we have to ship them. And obviously one of our most important goal, you could argue the, the only goal is to be more efficient, right? We are trying to change the way we take decision and action in such a way that we are uh, more and more efficient, which reduces price, um, but ultimately, you know, allows us to scale up, right? And so periodically we come up with a change. We are trying to maybe change the way we forecast things. Maybe we change the way we order things or where we place them. And we wanna know, is this change actually making a material impact? And our North Star for this is to run a lab, an A-B test effectively, where we have a treatment group, a control group, and we measure the difference in terms of efficiency, which for us is just free cash flow, right? Like if, if a product has been more profitable uh, in some sense, and I'm, I'm not talking about pricing here. So if we're just being more profitable in the way we've managed to buy it and place it, um, then we are basically measuring an increase in efficiency for a supply chain. Now, one of the issue we face is that our data is heavy tailed. And so we've been worried about the way we've run labs and the way we've analyzed them. And so we decided to do a retrospective of uh, a bunch of labs we've run since essentially 2017. So we have like roughly 700 labs that we've looked at and try to answer the question, could we be doing more with these, right? Can we get a better average treatment effect estimator? And what does better mean? And could we have a better decision policy in terms of what changes we decide to launch versus what changes we say, this is not useful and we should just stay on the, the old system, right? And so this is what this meta-analysis is about. Like it was originally to deal with heavy tail, but ultimately it's about how do I pick a good average treatment effect estimator and how do I pick a good rollout policy in terms of deciding what things are worth uh, launching and what things are not worth launching. And we, 
indeed found a much better estimator than what we're using at the moment. Uh, but more importantly, we have what we think is a better launch policy, which will increase the impact of our labs by a factor of two financially. I'm not saying it's changing the impact of Amazon's cash flow by a factor of two, but of the changes we're making, we could do a lot better uh, based on this meta-analysis. All right, so this is the overall context. Um, now, this is, let's see if I can change the slide here. Um, so these are the collaborator with whom this work was done. Uh, it was initially initiated by Nilesh, who did a lot of the, the original work. So uh, shout out to Nilesh for doing such a great job. Um, and he's just finishing his PhD at Berkeley right now. Obviously, myself was involved, uh, Drew Medica and Dean Foster, and then finally, Michael Jordan, who was who is actually uh, Nilesh's advisor. So he was also involved in this, or at least reviewed some of the work and gave his insights. Um, all right, so without further ado, let's go back to like what is what it is we're looking at. Now, as I said, we run multiple labs. There are different changes to the supply chain and they end up uh, essentially being your North Star, right? So we are trying to improve efficiency, which we think of as free cash flow. And once we make a change, or if we have a candidate change, so for, say for example, my team works a lot on forecasting, right? So we, we run back tests on uh, the demand forecast, which will impact buying. And now we have strong evidence that a new ML model is outperforming the existing model. Now that's not the same thing as saying it would lead to efficiency gain in the supply chain. So for us, the North Star is to go and run a lab. Now, what does a lab entails for us? Well, one of the key assumptions we make, and there's strong evidence for that, is that our products are fairly independent, right? Uh, a teddy bear is really not related to, you know, the Harry Potter book. They they tend to be fairly independent. There are some dependencies, but they're very hard to measure. So when we run a lab, we take our population of products and we assign them to treatment and control, simple A-B test. And then we let the, the model run for a number of weeks. So for say control, we use the old forecast, treatment, we use the improved forecast, let's say using transformers for a neural net. Um, and then we'll see the outcome in terms of cash flow for that product over a number of weeks, right? And so what we're after is a question of what was the average treatment effect? How much did we save? Did we save anything? Did we make it more efficient? And by how much? And then is it worth launching? Right? Given what we've observed, is this a change worth launching or not? So these are the two like big questions when we have a lab. And I'm gonna treat them slightly differently because some labs are mostly about inference, right? Like maybe we're doing a lab about pricing, which fundamentally isn't part of this, but maybe we're just trying to measure price elasticity, then that would be a pure inference lab. Uh, but maybe we're just trying to say, is that better than uh, this new model better than the old model, right? Um, so the first question is about inference of average treatment effect. The second question is about the value of launching. All right. Now, the simple choice here uh, would be to use the difference in need. You have your two population, you have the treatment population, you have the control population, and you basically take the difference in the average of their outcome. Right? And this is very appealing because uh, it's very simple, it's model free, and it should be unbiased, provided you did your randomization correctly, and provided that you have independence between your experimental units. Right? Now, once you have that, you can then argue as to what's the natural launch criteria. The, the classical statistical criteria would be statistical significance, right? At level alpha, uh, so say 0 0.05, right? So I say, hey, it's positive and statistically significant, I should launch, right? Now, it's worth noting already that this notion is really conservative. It's trying to say like, only if I have strong evidence for launching, should I launch? And it makes sense in context where we are, say, doing clinical trial for heart disease. You don't want to launch something if you know there's risk of death. Like the out, the negative outcome, it can be really high. Here we're just talking about money, which means we're linear in cash, and so we are not as risk averse as we would be in another context. Um, but 
theoretically, at least according to literature, we should be using statistical significance. All right. Now, one problem that we face at Amazon that's very important is uh, what I mentioned before is we have heavy tail. Right? So a few products kind of dominating the demand. So things like PS5, things like the frozen DVD, well, probably not as much anymore, but um, certain books are just way more popular than everything else. And so when we are running a lab and we're using the difference in means, where these few products land in terms of control and treatment will have a really high impact on the difference in means. It's basically just saying, yes, the difference in means is unbiased, but it's high variance. And so what this graph is showing you is just the total share of demand um, for products ordered by the most popular products. So what you're seeing here is that like the top 1% of products is already accounting for 25% of the demand. And so where these few products land in treatment and control will have a huge impact on what we observe in terms of average treatment effect. And so even though central limit theorem would say that like we have a very large sample, these heavy tails are really uh, impacting us and we, we still have a lot of variance. All right. So what can we do about it? Well, there's, there's actually in the tertiary quite a few uh, techniques to deal with this. Uh, one of them is to do a regression, right? I suggest difference in means. You can do something like difference in differences, or you can do a simple regression using pre-lab covariates. And what you're really trying to do in this case is say, well, this variance is high, but maybe it can be explained by pretreatment covariates. And so, yes, Harry Potter is popular, but I knew that already. So if I put its pre-lab demand, it explains a lot of its outcome. And so I'm kind of dealing with this uh, variance, right? And so I might, by running a regression, I might be introducing some bias, but I'm gonna reduce the variance a little bit. Now we can go even further and say, hey, yes, I'd like to do a regression, but uh, what if I just truncate? I, I just remove some points or I truncate, Windsorize the, the, the top products, what happens then? Right, I'm I'm less sensitive to these extreme values, or I can do a weighted regression. Which in this case, uh, what we're showing here would be a, a weighted regression, where the weight is based on the pre-lab demand. Right, so a very popular product is going to get downweighted, and so these few really high demand products are not going to count for as much as like the bulk of a product, which is where we usually make a lot of our money. Right, it's as much as those products are important, PS5 and whatnot, they are not the one that's driving the economics for Amazon. They're important for us because they drive traffic, but in practice, it's the bulk of the product that's driving the, the finances. So there's lots of candidates, models. In all these models have papers written about them in terms of like, you know, are they consistent and uh, in what context they work? Um, and so they all have good theoretical argument in favor of them, but it's hard to pick between them, right? We don't have an objective criteria for saying which one of them makes the most sense specifically for our use case. And so that's the question we're trying to answer. How do I rank these potential average treatment estimator in the context of our work, which is the uh, Amazon supply chain. So obviously the, the big issue with A-B tests is you don't have a target, right? You, you actually try to measure something and it's hard to treat this as a supervised learning problem. However, what's interesting is that you can kind of, it's not cheating, but you can kind of use the fact that you have multiple experimental units to kind of treat this problem from a supervised learning or trust validation perspective. And so what we did for meta-analysis is we said, look, we have multiple labs and every one of those labs has multiple products assigned to treatment and control. We can take the treatment group split in half and take the control group split in half. These two splits are gonna be independent. And so 
we can rely on the fact that the difference in mean is unbiased to kind of create a target for ourselves, right? So given an estimator E that I want to say something about in terms of like it's bias variance trade-off. So I'm hinting at mean squared error already. Um, I can use the difference in mean as my target. And so what we're computing here is effectively an estimator using one half of the lab. And then the other half of the lab, we use it to compute the difference in the mean, and we use the difference in the mean as our target. And so now I'm computing the square root error between the estimator of interest against the difference in mean. And in expectation, because the difference in mean is unbiased, and because my split is random, my mean squared error is basically going to be some constant plus the mean squared error that I'm actually after, which is the mean squared error of the estimator I want against the true average treatment effect. Now, the bias term, we could measure it. It's related to the difference in means bias, uh, mean squared error. But ultimately, we don't really care about it because what the equation in three is giving you is the ability to rank order your estimator, right? Because we care for the lowest mean squared error, which is the best compromise between bias and variance. And so because the constant is going to be the same for any estimator, this methodology gives me the ability to rank order my estimators by mean squared error. Let me just take a minute here to make sure that like all of this has made sense um, before I carry on to like what it looks like in practice. Is there any questions or clarification that might be warranted here? I'll take that as a note, so cool. All right, so we have a methodology for rank ordering your estimators. Unfortunately, we're still dealing with heavy tails. Not only are our product heavy tail, our labs themselves are heavy tails. So a few labs are really having like outsized, like I'm, here I'm saying long-term free cash flow, but it's really just think of it as like free cash flow. So if I'm ordering my labs by how much impact they have, they are also heavy tails. Some, some of our labs are really big, some of our labs are small. So we could have just looked at the MSC across lab for multiple estimator, but the fact that our labs themselves were also heavy tail made us decide to, instead of relying on just the raw MSC, to actually normalize our MSC. So we define a mean squared error score. So think of A and B as being the MSC for two different average treatment estimator, right? So this could be a simple OLS, A would be an OLS and B would be a weighted OLS. And so for every lab, I can compute the mean squared error for B and A and take their difference and then divide just to normalize, basically to make sure that the biggest labs are not dominating everything. That allows me to make claims about the difference in MSC for every pair of estimator. And that's what this matrix is showing you. It's basically saying difference in means compared to LS, difference in mean compared to weighted OLS. Now, the paper goes over a lot more estimator, linearization and whatnot, but this is already giving you a good picture uh, of like what we're finding, right? Like simple difference in mean is not particularly good compared to OLS and then OLS can be further improved by weighting or Windsorization. And that's kind of like our overall conclusion that yes, we are seeing some very uh, useful value when we try to robustify our average treatment effect estimator across labs, right? So all of this relies on the fact that we're not looking at one lab, we are looking at multiple labs, and then the MSC across all these labs is uh, significantly better for weighted OLS than for OLS or difference in means. Um, just to give you a slightly more visual representation uh, of what I just said, this is basically computing, I should have put an L here. This is basically computing this score that I've defined, um, but for all of our labs, right? So we have 700 labs and every point on this histogram is essentially one score uh, for one lab 
comparing the difference in mean versus uh, actually this is a well us, it's just an internal representation. And as we're seeing, this normalized score tends to be negative, which is just saying the general, the, the OLS is outperforming the difference in means. And in this case, the weighted OLS is outperforming the OLS. Does that, does everything make sense so far? Take that as a yes. Um, and so, from this internally, we've started analyzing our labs differently, um, started applying some winsorization and definitely some weighted least squares when trying to assess the value of our labs. Now, the bigger question that we face after we did this work is, okay, so we have a better average treatment estimator. We know that we are not necessarily worried about the worst outcome because nobody's going to die from what we do, right? So we're linear um, in cash. What should be your threshold? Should we still be using statistical significance um, as, as is classically used? Should we be less stringent um, or, or whatnot, right? And, and the the implicit assumption here that is important to know is that when you run a lab, usually you're interested in knowing something in the context where you're not sure, right? Like you have an existing medication and you have a new medication and you're not sure that the new one is better. And so from an ethical perspective, it makes sense to run the lab because you're not penalizing everyone. But if you have strong evidence that the new medication is better and you don't have what's called equipose, then ethically it gets a little trickier. Um, and so what we're really trying to measure here is, do we have equipose? By the time we arrive at the point where we're running a lab, do we have any, um, how should I say, prior that this particular change is good? And should we let that influence our decision? Now, how do we go about it? Well, ultimately, what we're trying to do is optimize our free cash flow, as I said before. And so our objective is having the most win and how much of a win do we have, right? And so what when we think about optimizing, optimizing a cash flow over a series of labs, what we're after is really this thing, which is, uh, so equation one, I'm not sure if you can see my, uh, my mouse. So, Equation on the bullet one shows first a sum over all the labs that we've run. N is the population of the lab. So certain labs are not affecting the full population. So maybe this lab is only impacting like close. Um, so the size of the lab in terms of its target population, the effect, the average treatment effect for that lab times the decision, right? So D is a binary decision based on the evidence we have, either the average treatment effect estimator or some other evidence. And so what we really want to optimize is this object. Now, if I knew the average treatment effect estimator, it'd be easy to optimize, but we don't. We have an estimator for it, um, but it might be biased, especially if we don't use a difference in mean. And so basically what we did is play the same trick as before. Say, well, I'm gonna split every one of my labs and I'm gonna use half my data to get an unbiased estimate of the average treatment effect. And I'm going to write, use the remaining part of my lab to take a decision, right? Either use, um, you know, my, my p-value, my critical t-statistics, or some other summary, a more complicated summary of the evidence I have to decide whether I launch or not. And so what we're really trying to optimize is this object here, which is an empirical version of the top one. And I'm saying, I want to find the decision rule that will optimize S hat. And again, by unbiasedness of the difference in means and independence of my split, this object is going to be unbiased for the true free cash flow that I'm after. All right. So basically playing the same trick, except that now my loss function isn't the mean squared error. I'm not trying to do a bias variance straight off. It's actually optimizing long term free cash flow 
based on a binary decision after my lab. <laughs> so this is what it looks like in practice. Now, this is a somewhat complicated graph. So I'll, I'll spend a bit of time explaining it. Um, I mean, it's not that complicated. It's somehow not intuitive. So I'm showing you three estimator. Let's start with just using the difference in means, right? Because it's the simplest one. And, um, and what you have to think about is that the x-axis is my critical t statistics. So if I'm using, you know, classic statistics, I should be launching if I am positive and statistically significant, which would be a critical t statistics of 1.96. And that is what the dotted line on the right is showing you. So if we were gonna launch um, only based on statistical significance, we would be launching at the rightmost dotted line. And I've actually normalized the financial impact on what we're using right now, which is actually the OLS. So the red curve, intersection between the red curve and the rightmost dotted line is what we're using currently for deciding to launch or not. Okay. And so that would be the classical way of doing things. Now, if I increase my critical T statistics, I'm basically saying I need even more evidence before I'm comfortable launching a treatment. And at the extreme, if I go to an infinite critical T statistic, I'm saying irrespective of the outcome of the lab, I'm just not going to launch anything. Meanwhile, if I go towards the left, the negative critical T statistic, I'm saying I'm going to launch anything irrespective of what the lab is saying. Right? I'm just ignoring the evidence. I'm just, we're aggressive. We're not risk averse. We launch everything. And so, what was very interesting for us is to find that the optimal point for our data was somewhere around minus 0.96. Actually, the Official optimal is minus point, uh, sorry, minus 1.2, which you can kind of read as you should launch anything unless it's statistically significant and negative, right? which was kind of surprising. Now, in practice, we could argue that that was kind of the default. A lot of people have reason to launch their things, even if they're not statistically significant and positive. Um, but for us, we're seeing more than a 2x impact in terms of the value of our treatments if we are comfortable with launching more aggressively. And as I hinted before, what is really happening here is that we don't have equipos. By the time someone is running a lab, they've accumulated a lot of evidence in favor of, uh, of the treatment, right? For to make a change in the supply chain requires lots of back tests, requires lots of engineering hours. And so we tend to be internally extremely careful as to what we bring all the way to a lab. And so our prior implicitly on the kind of treatments we lab tends to be strongly in favor for positive impact, which means that in practice, we need strong evidence against the treatment or the, the the actual treatment before it's worth us not launching. And in fact, we found that if you launch anything without regard for uh, the lab, it still outperforms what we should officially be doing or we think we should officially be doing, which is to use statistical significance. Now, I want to clarify, this has a lot to do with our supply chain. There are other teams at Amazon that run experiments where they are running experiments that I would call more like phishing experiments. They change the color on a widget on the website, right? And they don't have strong evidence, it's easy to do. They're not finding the same thing, right? Um, it's really that implicitly we have a strong bias in our data in favor of having good science changes before we run a lab and that is showing up in our data. Uh, now, I've shown you everything here up until now without showing you uncertainty. I think I wouldn't be a good statistician if I didn't actually give you a sense of like how much uncertainty there is around uh, these curves. <laughs> now, this is showing you basically the best estimator, the weighted OLS. Um, 
what's interesting is there is quite a bit of uncertainty. And in this case, we, we're just basically using uh, bootstrapping to estimate this, this uncertainty. And our conclusion is that, yes, there's a big difference between our current criticality statistics and what we think is the optimal. There is less of a difference if you think of it in terms of the difference between the estimator, right? Like we do prefer weighted OLS and we have evidence for it. But if you think in terms of decision, they all tend to agree that a more aggressive launch policy is positive, And that is within noise uh, across estimator for this particular question. All right. Now, if I go back, well, actually, let me go back physically to this objective that I'm trying to optimize. I, I wrote the decision rule in terms of an estimator. And I showed you a graph in terms of a critical T statistics. And I basically scan all potential values in my critical T statistics um, and showed you that one, like minus 1.2 is actually better than 1.96, which would be the, the classic uh, value. But nothing forces me to use a critical T statistics. I could make this decision rule as complicated as I want it to be. Um, I could use multiple estimators. I could use pre-lab uh, features um, and whatnot. So I could make this more complicated and that's exactly what we tried to do. So what we did is we basically compared a using critical T statistics versus using a random forest where in the random forest, we gave it multiple uh, estimators and we gave it pre-lab demand uh, and pre-lab cash flow to see if it could come up with a nonlinear you know, uh, decision policy that would outperform a simple statistical test. And our result is that no, actually it seems like a simple t-statistics is a very good summary uh, the value of a lab, right? And in a way, we're more comfortable with this because there, there's an element of like trusting launch to a black fox that we weren't too happy with, but we felt it was still a necessary exercise. But so uh, what we're finding is that compared to say T-critical 1.96, the classical value, yes, a random forest will do better, uh, but our optimal critical T-statistics of minus 1.2 still outperforms a nonlinear model. Um, and I'll get to the online value in a second. Um, but yeah, so it's not statistically significant in terms of difference between random forests and using just a t-test, but there's no reason to use a random forest if we don't have to. We still, those labs still take a lot of time. We still are very careful about what they mean. And so we're much more comfortable with um, using a simple t-test for this, right? Now, there is an important criticism that we are addressing here uh, of actually this plot here, which is that when we're computing this, I computed an optimization over all my labs and I found what was the best value across all my lab. And so in effect, I could be overfitting, right? I am implicitly testing on train. I am making a claim that I'm making more cash flow if I use this value and then I test it on the same lab I use to actually find this value. And so we wanted to try to avoid uh, this downfall, if only to make sure that whatever conclusion we reach generalizes to any future lab we have. And so the way we went about doing that was to say, hey, these labs are actually ordered in time, right? And yes, we're assuming they are independent. There's, there's good reason to believe they are just by the way they tend to be run and how the teams are done. Um, but we're assuming they're additive, we're assuming they're independent, but they actually are ordered in time. And so the more interesting question for us was, can I find a better group critical T statistics only using the lab that I've seen up until now, right? So instead of making claim on the same, val uh, same data that I've used to find my value, what if 
say I'm at lab 100 of 700. What if I can only use the first 100 labs to decide what is the best critical T statistics to use for deciding the next lab? So basically treat that as an online learning problem. And what we're finding is that this still works. This still works fine. So even protecting yourselves against overfitting, um, we're doing great. So the online critical T statistics is exactly what I described. I'm using whatever lab I've seen up until now to decide what value to use. And overall, we outperform the random forest. We clearly outperform 1.96. We're obviously not doing as well as the value in hindsight of minus 1.2 because we're not fitting um, on all our data at once, but we're not far off, right? And so this methodology we feel is much more robust in a future lab, uh, which is essentially our next step internally of like go and collect more labs and just validate that this set stayed true. And if anything, one of our big concern is that now that we've started publicizing this result, we start saying like, hey, we think you should launch pretty much anything that you're ready to bring to a lab. This might lead to a distributional shift in terms of what scientists are comfortable labbing, right? If I'm already telling you that your threshold is lower, then you're gonna be like, oh yeah, well, I'm just gonna lab more things. Um, and so we are curious to see if that's going to get reflected in the online decision problem perspective of saying, up until now, most of the labs are good. Now that I'm telling you the labs are good, people are lowering their standards and actually we have to re react accordingly. Um, so that's basically what where we are at right now. Now, seems like I, I went through all my slides very fast, so you'll have lots of time for questions. Um, but essentially the high level conclusions for us is that by having access to this corpus of labs that we ran uh, over many years <coughs> on the same population um, and with the same target, right? Like our, our end metric is the same across all the labs. So having access to a corpus of multiple labs on the same population with the same end, uh, end metric, allows us to come up with a data-driven way to separate or basically compare estimators and compare policies uh, in terms of decision rules. And internally, we've decided to use much more robust estimators for average treatment effect estimator. And we uh, are also starting to be much more lenient in terms of you know, what is the threshold you have to meet in terms of long, uh, free cash flow impact before you decide that a change that has done its due diligence um, is what launched it. Now, obviously we are interested in running this on other data set more broadly, externally, hopefully. Turns out that finding such data set is uh, difficult. So I don't know how easy it will be uh, to do that. But if anyone here is aware of a corpus of random uh, control trials on a, a one specific question where the end metric is always the same, and essentially sampling from the same population, we'd really like to hear about it because we'd like to try this, uh, this methodology again. Uh, but that is essentially it for me. So thank you. Um, I have a few people I'd like to thank. Robert Stein, Edo, RD, Kenny, Shirley, that have all helped us internally uh, on this work. So I open it up to questions if you have any. Okay, thanks for the really nice talk. Um, yeah, are there any questions from the from the audience? There, there are a few things I was thinking about um, throughout the talk. So, uh, I'm you know I'm I'm not so familiar with some of these topics, so they might also be silly questions. But but I'm thinking so I'm I'm wondering about this about the random forest not performing well. Is it is it overfitting that's happening here? Uh, we we only have 700 points. Yeah. Um, it definitely could be overfitting. Um, we did not explore the question in depth because we knew that culturally, just this change is already very big. Mm -hmm. 
right? So if I'd seen the random forest outperform, I'd be like, okay, I really need to think about this and figure out what it is about this combination of estimators that makes it better. Um, now, if I only give it one estimator, then yes, it should be able to find the same, draw the same conclusion that like, this is where you should, you know, decide yes or no. Um, but ultimately we still, these are big labs. They have huge impact. We're okay having somebody at the wheel, right? And like, as I said, the 700 collected over roughly three or four years, it's okay to have a manual review and looking at these estimators is something we're comfortable with. Um, so I need, I guess what I'm saying is I would have need to see like strong evidence that random forest without compete before I'm happy. So yes, I could play more, but I don't think there's any chance that even if I'm careful, I'm gonna be so far better that it's even worth exploring would be the, the, the short answer. Are there are there other nonlinear models that make sense to to try instead of random forest, like something with neural networks? Or what is mm, it? I I do feel like seven hundred points is just isn't enough. It's just not enough data to make yeah. it. So. Yeah, it's a corpus that's bigger. Like, I'd be curious to see how say Google would think about this, right? Because they're running multiple labs every week on okay. um, basically different UI change. In that context, I'd be interested in the question of like, hey, is there a more interesting nonlinear model that might eke out more out of every single one of your labs? Right? Yeah, yeah. In our context, we're not there yet. We don't, we just, they, these labs takes too much planning for us to have the scale where it works. But we are talking internally to the UI folks yeah. about like how they think about this and what, what they envision uh, would make sense. It is oh there's there's a question in the QA box. I'll, I'll pause my so Charles Doss has a question. What is the actual random forest decision rule? What like you want me to look at the random forest, what it decides to do? I think maybe the question is more like how does the how are you using random forests to make a decision rule? Or okay, so, so we'll, we'll yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. So I mean, I think of it in terms of like, you know, what features I'm putting inside. It is a random forest that's doing classification. Uh, actually, no, this random forest was actually trying to predict how much cash this particular lab would be. And then I do the binary decision. The, the classification one wasn't performing as well. Um, and so what we were curious about when we did the random forest was a question of, are different estimator giving you a slightly different picture, right? So I do have pre-lab features, but they don't seem to be very important. What we really were interested in is when I'm using, when I have difference in means, when I have OLS, when I have weighted OLS, or if I have weighted OLS with different weights, are they giving me a slightly different picture of what's happening? And if so, the implicit idea was that by combining them, we might be able to, you know, outperform using just one estimator, right? And so the, the hope was that the, these estimator were somewhat independent and giving us different perspective. And the answer was like, no, actually the random forest is just using one of them to kind of decide and it may be getting overfitted on a few others. But for us, there isn't evidence that at least within the set of estimators we've used, that they are somewhat independent and there's a way to leverage that to do a better, to take a better decision. Okay, thanks. There's, there's a follow-up question from Charles as well in the, in the Q&A. You wanna look, so the comment is, if, if you do standard classification, then it is in a sense using different prior information, i.e. using T critical value of zero. If you're using classification, I'm not sure I understand your question, Charles. So your your random forest is a is a classification model here, or it's a random sure. forest. I mean, I this one was actually a regression, but I did both. Uh, yeah. This one was just performing a bit better, so the the answer will apply to either. 
but I'm not sure what Charles is trying to ask here. So my, I mean, I'm thinking of it in terms of, I'm just giving it features and it has to decide whether to do, to launch or not. And then it's getting an outcome in terms of whether it was a win or not, right? Now, by doing that, you're kind of normalizing it, uh, which is why I think the, the binary one doesn't perform as well, right? Implicitly, when I'm computing this objective, this the reward is weighted by the population and the average treatment effect, which is why the binary decision um, is better scaled in, in terms of the average treatment effect in the population. But ultimately, if I treat that as just win and loss, right? This was a good lab, this was a bad lab, this was a good lab, and I just treat them as normalized, which for some in some contexts might make more sense. I'm yes, the original random forest will just assume that T critical T of zero is the right thing, but then it's going to learn something else. So I'm not sure I understand the second part of your question. And I'm happy to Charles, take it. Charles is raising his hand. Sorry, I, I, I didn't notice that. Can I can I unmute you or something to allow you to talk? Okay, sorry. Here. Sorry, I'm clearly new to this webinar stuff. Okay, hey, I think you should be able to talk now, Charles. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hey, sorry. I think typing was a little uh, <laughs> a little hard. So it's not that in in depth a question. I just it was just kind of a minor comment, which is I felt like the T. I think you said it in a sense in your last sentence there, which is yeah. the T critical value. Part of the idea is in this, you're, you're sort of using some prior information that says that actually in this population, you, unless it definitely looks bad. So the way I'm thinking about it is you're, you, there's some loss function. Yeah. And actually the loss function takes into account here, maybe both your loss, which is linear and prior information, which sort of skews you towards acceptance. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, basically the question is, is there anything of that nature incorporated in the random forest, whether you're doing it in a regression or prediction way or a classification way, it seemed like that actually, you know, trying to incorporate this sort of prior or this loss information might be relevant. Although, of course, everything you just said made it seem like you, it's maybe not that uh, important a question for you, given your 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 practical yeah. reasons yeah, yeah. to stick with what you're doing. But anyway, that was the that was the long winded uh, chat. I, I I think question. what you're hinting at, Joel, is like why aren't we taking a Bayesian approach if I'm actually implicitly talking about the fact that I think what's going on is there's a prior, right? And why am I still using a regression? Uh, perspective I don't yeah I don't know if it has to be Bayesian but but I think you could I'm I mean I'm asking or curious if you design you know you could build a classification that pushes you towards uh, right which is yeah yeah and and internally there's there is a debate on this we feel like I'm on the side of the debate that feels more comfortable with the notion of like yes there's probably a prior I rather not bake it in, right? What I'm mm -hmm. really trying mm -hmm. to do is like falsify something. So I'm making a claim, this is going to make money. And then I check and mm -hmm. I want an objective that says as much. I could try to compute implicitly what I think the true prior is on your or average treatment effect and then state it as like, well, this is what it is right now. Mm -hmm. And I could recompute it, but uh, we are... We're targeted towards the action, right? Like if I give you the prior, what action are you going to do differently? And if I give you a prior now, what if it changes, right? Like mm -hmm. what if there's a distributional shift? I don't want to be um, sensitive to that. And so I prefer using a pure like, this is the best decision rule given what we're seeing right now. And if there's a distributional shift, we should start seeing it after a few lab and we should change our policy accordingly, right? Um, 
And so reporting a prior or trying to bake in a prior, I guess you could in the online fashion, right? It could be interesting to start with a prior and then see if it slowly depends less and less on the prior and start taking decision just based on what it has right now. Um, but ultimately, we try to stay focused on the end metric of was this valuable and what is your action? and try to bake in as little modeling as possible. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. And enjoy the talk. Yeah, thanks for the nice talk. Thank you. Yeah. So is, is there any like active learning here? It, it kind of has the, this 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 flavor, like when you show the plots where you're looking at the performance against the trial index or something. Um, you mean this how, like, or this one? No, like later on when you're looking at the, uh, yeah, oh, later, this one, this one here. So this is like this, this, if I understand it, like it's the, the X axis is the, is the randomized controlled trial index. And you're looking at the performance. If you just use the first like K, K trials or something, right? Yes. Is so, right? so only one of the, the, only the purple line is on, is, uh, an online decision rule. Right? Okay. So it's the only one that's only retrospective and not uh, looking in hindsight. Yeah. Random forest is trained in the hindsight. Yep. Okay. Uh, actually, maybe not this one. Anyway, yes, I think it is. The uh, the green line is just one point ninety six, and then the pink line is the best value we find over the whole population. So it's definitely in hindsight. And so, okay. Okay. The the purple line should be getting better over time but it does seem that like actually by being i guess there is a prior here which is i start at zero right yeah. so i start which is kind of part of what charles is asking my first rule is use just zero mm -hmm. uh and that's why it usually performs a bit better at the beginning and then it slowly um gets worse but the, here a bayesian model would have been interesting i kind of agree with that but uh, the online learning would be, I think, trying to say, like, what should be the next lab I should run? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, active learning, sorry. Active, active this, learning. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The online is what we do. We don't really have that kind of scenario here because these labs are very different in nature. Okay. Right? Some of them are going to be about where we place things. Um, some of them are going to be who we buy from. Uh, some of them are going to be what level of inventory we're after. Another one is going to be when do we decide that a product is not selling and we should mark it down and how, what price we should set, right? And so this is not really answering, there, there's not a, at least at the moment, there's not a good um, way to think about where we think the next value is. I'm not saying it's impossible. Mm -hmm. But we haven't had the space of potential labs is not well mapped because those changes can be really significant, right? Right. Uh, right. And 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 they can be of like very different nature, size of trucks, or do we rely more like do we offer more same day shippings and and whatnot? And so it's an interesting question. I don't think we have the scale of labs relative to the space of uh, of the question we could ask. Yeah. And and it's not a static space. The business changes enough that what is what we care to lab in the future is very different from what we've labbed in the past. Okay, that, that makes sense, yeah. yeah. Is it, so um, you, you were saying like, is there any other data out there that this can be applied to? Like, does it, does it make sense to look at like medical data like random yeah <laughs> treatments <laughs> so i've given a talk about this at the french hutch in the hope that they would kind of like have a data set uh i was pointed to online data set that do exist uh and so there is a few things like alzheimer and heart disease where i think it would be interesting but when i looked into the process of getting access to this data i let's just say i was a little uh scared or apprehensive it's like just to get one trial can be a multiple month process so 
maybe there's a way for us to do a blank request for multiple labs and and we're considering doing that but we're still hoping that there's still uh other data sets that exist right now that we can use so let's just say it's our last resort and i mean it makes sense privacy reasons are a huge issue we're lucky to have access to this we're not looking at people we're looking at products and we've controlled all of our labs so it's it's a very special scenario which unfortunately seems to be more prevalent in the industry. Uh, but yes, I I would love to get access to a corpus of lab like that for a medical purpose. Okay. Yeah. And I guess there it's also this problem of like what lab should you run next is a really important question in medical trials and stuff. But that's 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 sort of active learning question too. Yeah. So so yeah, so so can you can you say briefly why why is it the case that like you have so few of these labs, whereas like you were saying Google would have would have oh more? Yeah, no, so because their supply chain changes, they require a lot of uh tests, right? Because we're gonna interface with vendors and suddenly they're gonna get something else from us and we want to preserve a certain amount of well, we want to preserve trust with them. And um, and they're complicated systems that are interacting. And so even from an engineering perspective, like just software perspective, they they run a lot of tests just to make sure we haven't broken the pipeline. Yeah. Because you know, if you run a test like this just before Christmas and it breaks the pipeline, well, suddenly Amazon does it can't, you know, deliver anything for Christmas. And that's a huge deal. So just from a software engineering perspective, these tests have a high threshold okay. before they launch into production. And because of that, science takes the perspective that like, well, we should have a very credible model before we do this, as opposed to a scenario where UI is, well, I don't know what colors people prefer. I don't know what size buttons people prefer. And in that context, it's much easier to just kind of run multiple tests and just find which one is the best, right? Like you're, you don't have a framework in which to reason about what would be better as opposed to supply chain, which is like, well, I can think about what, you know, there's mathematical model about like what would in theory be the optimal amount to buy uh, for efficiency and what would be the optimal amount, or, you know, distribution of products uh, across the country so that people have access to it, right? Like improve trying to balance uh, customer experience relative to the cost of distributing it, right? Like, and so we can come up with models that kind of try to answer these questions, but then we don't know if these models were good, which is why we go and run these labs. So um, I think the, the fact that we have good, well, reasonable science for guiding us makes it worthwhile us taking the scientific approach first before we run a lab. And then because the impact can be so large, then there's uh, big criteria before it's people are okay, even running a lab. Right, it's not like just changing the size of a button or something and something. Exactly, like yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Um, any any questions from the students that are in the in the audience about, about the talk or about, about anything? Anything else? I guess I guess not then. So um, so yeah, I don't I don't have any any additional questions that have come to mind. Um, so maybe that's that's about about it. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Know, thanks again for the talk. It was really.